As the Iraq occupation continued, the right also began pointing at everything the US government was doing in Iraq to build schools, hospitals, roads, parks, and so on. It seemed that the domestic socialism they'd oppose when done by Democrats at home became something to cheer on when done by the government abroad. Why is it that conservatives say that, and you know, Sheldon talked about this, but why is it they say they support free markets and are skeptical of a welfare state, but then champion an American-created welfare state in Iraq as some sort of victory? Well, I think it's either they don't believe this propaganda, the war propaganda, or their opposition to such social spending isn't grounded in any real understanding of economics or property rights. It has to be one or the other. At any rate, many Americans who had now bought into the nationalist arguments, or who had not bought into them, who, who had rejected the, the, the Saddam was a threat, began to swallow this internationalist baloney and agree that the U.S. could not withdraw. No way. No. We owe it to the Iraqis to give them their liberal democracy. As if this were possible, you know, checkpoints, curfews, U.S imposes an income tax in Iraq, gun bans. Saddam Hussein, horrible, you know, as if we don't all know, horrible guy. Um, people in Baghdad had personal arms that the US helped the uh, new regime round up. The US, there was even a story, I think about a year ago, US soldiers import, Im, imposing price controls or enforcing price controls on, on gasoline in Iraq. It's, so, you know, so as the occupation continued, even as the nationalist security reasons had been discredited, uh, there was this internationalist defense that kicked in. But there was, there's still a hubristic element of American supremacism here, an idea that we, we, know, we know what's best for them. Ironically, ironically, the same people who argue that the Muslims can handle des democracy as well as, as we can also argue they can't do it without hol us holding their hands while we're armed to the teeth, since we can hardly trust them to govern themselves. It's very, very interesting logic. But overall, what was once a very nationalist justification became a very different argument. And, you know, before, it was the classic warmongering argument. We have to kill foreigners, including civilians, to save Americans and assert American honor. This was the sentiment right after 9-11. And if you didn't go along with it, you cared more about foreigners than Americans and were un-American. Then it shifted. All of a sudden, it was a matter of letting Americans continue to die so as to protect Iraqis. All of a sudden, if you were against American involvement since it compromised our security and consumed our wealth, you were some sort of isolationist who didn't care about human rights. It seems like there's no end to the justifications for mass murder, all under the guise of protecting human life. Okay. Now, this also applies to the calculation between life and liberty. After 9-11, we were all told we must sacrifice a little liberty so as to save our lives. We were told that Americans and foreigners must sacrifice lives in order to secure liberty. My head is spinning. Are Americans dying for our freedom, or are we enslaving ourselves to keep alive? Which is it? Now, now, why should we trust politicians with this calculation, even if we believe there was some justice to it? Which, of course, anyone who believes in individual rights wouldn't believe in this. But why, why trust this to the central planner and the politician? No, it's not Bill Clinton or George Bush or Hillary Clinton or Rudy Giuliani. I know, I heard, actually, I heard Rudy Giuliani. I used to have bad opinions of him, but I read something recently. He was actually the mayor of New York City during 9-11. <laughs> And I, I, I don't know, I feel bad about everything I said about this guy. He was actually, I mean, anyone who, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, when I think of Rudy Giuliani, okay, okay, okay. But, but as, as, you know, as, uh, you know, as Christ-like of a figure as he is, the, these guys, it's not these politicians whose freedom and lives are at risk. It's the lives of American troops foreigners, and uh, given the re reality of blowback, Americans, uh, 
that the, the, it's these that the politicians are playing with. It is our liberty at home that has suffered. And if you look at life uh, for Iraqi Christians or Iraqi w women or almost any Iraqi who wasn't a direct enemy of Saddam's regime, it's their liberty too. For some reason, this nation, which was born out of revolution against the British Empire, and sees that as a revolution for liberty and self-governance, even though America was far from perfect. There was slavery, but we see the revolution against the British as good. But for some reason, we see Iraqi resistance to US empire as evil. Why? Because they have problems in their culture. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, another thing that doesn't make sense is this whole thing fighting for our freedom. I wrote this piece on the anniversary of 9-11 about uh, surrendering, because you know, right after 9-11, of course, the proper thing to do was withdraw, get the US empire down, close down the bases and everything. But uh, you know, the hawks said that that'd be surrendering to what the Islamists want. But they also said the Islamists don't want us. They don't care about our foreign policy. They, they care about our freedom. So on the one hand, just closing down the empire, which would be good for our freedom, certainly our economic freedom, that supposedly, that's giving into the terrorists and what they want, even though the terrorists don't hate our foreign policy, they hate our liberty. So you'd think that the real surrendering to the, to the terrorists would be giving up our liberty.